I think we're going to start, uh, kind of a natural place to start is just to talk about what do we think we know and why we think we know it. I, mean, I think, you know, from a, uh, and, and then ultimately why any of that matters, you know, why being right or wrong or close enough matters. Um, for me, it, it, it's, you know, coming from more of a, a life science and philosophy of mind background that the thing that that strikes me as the, the potential hubris of our whole enterprise is that there, there is a, a clear scientific rationale for being skeptical about our powers to know what's going on here. And that's, I mean, if you just take evolution as your starting point, there's no reason why apes like ourselves should know a damn thing about what's going on here, despite the fact that our, that our, our science and, our, and the technology that it spawns is incredibly useful, and we, we seem to be playing a language game with ourselves, one that's augmented by the language of mathematics, that is producing less ignorance and more knowledge. I mean, it seems to be pushing back the frontier of, so, of, of something that is fundamentally bewildering. There's, there's a mystery that we confront. We don't understand why we get sick, and then we discover viruses and bacteria. And I mean, there's, there's, there seems to be progress, right? But it's just... There, there is no reason to expect that the, the intuitions we rely on to do science should be fitted to reality in any deep way. Because if, if we look at our you know, chimpanzee cousins, it's obvious not only do they not know a damn thing about what's going on, they couldn't possibly know a damn thing about what's going on. And we are just a slight iteration beyond them as a matter of you just you know, uh, apes having evolved. So wh where do you, as a scientist, uh, get your, your confidence that the, the game you play, as a, as a physicist in particular, is actually bringing you and other physicists close, in, into closer context, in contact with Yeah. Them? Well, I mean, I share certainly a lot of that intuition. In fact, um, you know, I had a, a, a TV show many, many years ago where uh, it was on the first book I wrote, and there was one scene where I'm at a blackboard lecturing on the general theory of relativity, and clearly I'm lecturing to a student that's not quite getting it, and the camera slowly pans, and it's a dog. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, I got so many people, the response was they thought I was trying to say the audience was like the dog, which right. wasn't the point. The point was exactly the one that you're making, which is dogs are these intelligent creatures, but yet there's a limit to what they can understand. And we think that they don't understand, for instance, the general theory of relativity. And every time I say that, I always think maybe the dogs are out there that oh, they think we don't understand general relativity. <laughs> but, you know. uh, but assuming that's not the case, uh, here, here we have a, a, a very good example of smart beings that are limited in what they can understand. So why is it that we aren't in the same boat and presumably we are in the same boat? So, so I think that's a given, that we may be limited in what we can understand, but to the specifics of your question, why is it that we think we're making progress? It's very straightforward. We can sit down with the equations of quantum electrodynamics and calculate properties of electrons. They're magnetic properties, the details don't really matter, but the calculation agrees with the measurement decimal by decimal by decimal, 10 places after the decimal point. Right. That's enough. I'm done. I mean, you know, <laughs> think about that. That is an astonishing fact that these strange gloppy things inside of our head can figure out the mathematics to, to understand the property of a particle to one part in, in a billion. Mm. And it agrees with the measurement. And at that point, you say to yourself, for some reason that we can't quite understand, mathematics provides this powerful illumination into the dark qualities of the universe and allows us to make progress on questions that don't seem to have any relevance to survival, right? But yet somehow the brain has gotten to the point where it can figure these things out. And I shouldn't even say, it's not even not just they don't have relevance to survival. One imagines that back on the savanna, those of our forebears who got caught up thinking about black holes and quantum physics, they got eaten, head, yes. right? <laughs> you know, so it's like not good for us right. to do this, but yet somehow we're able to. Yeah, well, we have the, the, the last scene that we know about where that was almost certainly true was Archimedes in his bathtub 
Yeah, that's making, a curious making one. Making some more breakthrough in, in geometry, and then a Roman soldier just came in and impaled him. Uh, so first rule of self-defense, you can stop with the math when someone kicks down your door. Uh, so, so let's, I just want to revisit some of the points you just made there, because so people have made, I've, I've, I've heard, I've been a consumer of skeptical utterances on this very topic, so I think yeah. there was one uh, popular book on physics I read years ago, I think it was probably a John Gribben book, uh, and it was, he said in there that, this, that there's, there's a famous paper by uh, Wigner, I, I believe, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics and the Natural Sciences, or something close to that title. Yes, that's right. And so it's, it's been pitched as this mystery that mathematics is, uh, seems to map onto reality in a way that is surprising and counterintuitive, and we're, we're still just trying to make sense of that. But I think it was Gribben who wrote that actually the, the idea that mathematics is it, that it's surprising that mathematics maps onto reality. It's a little bit like saying it, it's surprising that the English language is, is so good for writing plays in, right? That there's like, like, like the, this is the thing we're, we're using and we're finding ways to fit it to the circumstance we're in. That is, it seems, it seems to me that there may be a serious disanalogy there in that in, mathematics, unlike English, seems to indicate it seems to make predictions about what should be so. I mean, the relationship between electricity and magnetism, say, um, which then can be tested and proven to be true, that the mathematics yeah. itself sort of shines a light in a direction we weren't necessarily looking. Right. Is, there, is, is that, one, is that valid, but is, is, is there more to it than that? Uh, I don't think there's more to it than that, but that's a, a breathtaking quality, yeah. right? I mean, the fact that you know, use English to articulate thoughts and describe situations, sure, that's the mode that we have developed for that kind of communication. But mathematics is not a natural language, right? Mathematics is a way that we have found of encapsulating pattern in the world, but yet when we have identify the pattern, we can then use it to go far beyond the context in which it was developed. So, you know, Einstein is thinking about space and time and, and the special theory of relativity, 1905, 1906, 1907. Then he takes this mathematics off the shelf in about 1912, a body of mathematics called Ramanian geometry that was largely developed in an abstract realm of mathematics to describe curved shapes, the kind of thing that the idle mathematical mind might find interesting, but not because we were trying to describe the external world. He takes that mathematics, is able to work with it into this generalized version of relativity, the general theory of relativity, and then make predictions about how stars in the distant night sky should look when their light traverses near the sun. Mm. And the way that those positions of the stars shift is then borne out by photographs taken four years later during a solar eclipse when the stars become visible. Yeah. That, that's the craziness, right? He wasn't trying to describe the motion and the position shifting of those stars, and yet he was able to make a statement about something that he had never received any data on and it agreed with subsequent measurements. Right. That's the part that is absolutely thrilling. Well, so there, there are physicists and mathematicians that have a quasi-mystical, quasi-platonic notion about it, the significance of all this. Like, so, so what's your explanation, if you have one, for why math seems to reach into the, the darker corners of reality for us? I sort of look at it two ways, and it kind of depends on, on how a given day is going, you know, when you're doing the calculations. I mean, sometimes it feels like you're just sort of chipping away at the stone, revealing the beautiful sculpture, as if it's already out there, and all you're doing is revealing it. Other days, when it's not going so well, it just feels like you're desperately trying to invent the ideas in order to be able to make progress. So. I kind of go back and forth between the two, I have to say. I don't have a consistent view of the role of mathematics in this regard. And I would even say there are times when I have, I don't know if worried is the right word, but I've imagined the possibility 
that one day we make contact with an alien civilization and they say, hey, show us what you guys have figured out. And we bring out the textbooks with all of our beautiful equations and they kind of look at it and they go, nah. They put you in a video where you're the dog. <laughs> yeah, right. They basically, yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, they, they basically say, you know, we, we tried that for a while. It's kind of a dead end, guys. It'll take you just so far. Yeah. But then the funny thing is, if I try to imagine what they would replace it with, I don't even, I can't even think of what they would replace it with that isn't in some sense mathematics, perhaps in an unrecognizable form, or an unfamiliar form, perhaps a better way of saying it, because if math is a language of pattern, what are we doing? We're all just trying to encapsulate patterns. So whatever language you use to do that, maybe that is what math ultimately should be described as, and therefore will always be back to this kind of structure. Right. There's another physicist who I've spoken with on my podcast a couple of times, David Deutsch, who I know you know. Um, and I, for, uh, forgive me, David, I've forgotten the reason why you believe this, but I believe he thinks that we are, um, we're, there, in principle, we, can, we as math using, language forming, cognitive systems, are not cognitively closed to anything that could be known, given, I mean, I, th I think it has, in his mind, something to do with, with a, a, a deep result around information theory and the universality of computation. I mean, but I, I, I don't think I can represent his view faithfully here. But he, the, the net result is he thinks that the notion that we could meet an alien intelligence or build a super intelligent computer that we couldn't understand on some level, that where we would stand as the dog in relation to that super intelligent system, he thinks that's a, a, uh, a false fear or, or just in principle impossible. Do you have any reason to, to feel that? Or? I mean, I have to understand more fully exactly what he's saying, but I mean, clearly, if you take our very species and you just, you know, wind the clock back however far you want to go, 30,000 years, 50,000 years, 70,000 years, I mean, there would be a cognitive mismatch relative to where we are today. Yeah. So it's certainly the case that given enough time, we can get to the point, obviously, here we right. are. But I could certainly imagine that we encounter an alien intelligence and they are exponentially beyond anything that we have understood, and therefore we would be like ants. Yeah. And in fact, I think that's a good possibility as to why they're not paying attention to us. Well, I, th I think that's part of his argument, yeah. I, I actually, that takes me exactly where I want to go, but I think that is part of his argument that we're given enough time or given enough you know, augmentation of ourselves, we could fuse our cognitive horizon with anything else that we could meet. Um, but on, so on that point, where the hell is everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 maybe you, you can remind people what the Fermi problem is and, and then tell us what you... Yeah, uh, you know, and, Enrico Fermi, uh, great physicist, uh, is credited with, it's usually framed as the Fermi paradox, I guess, uh, which is, look, there's so many stars out there, so many, in fact, now we know for, for a fact that there are so many planetary systems out there Therefore, you expect there's a lot of life out there. Where are they? Why haven't they come and visited us? It's sort of a you know, quick way of describing uh, the question. And, um, but yeah, I think uh, uh, it's an interesting thought to, to contemplate. I think there are many, many explanations for, for why they haven't come here. It could be, like I was saying, we're just not interesting enough, right? I mean, how many times... Do we stop on the street and, and, and have conversations with bacteria, right? So if we're bacteria, you know, they're like, let's wait, you know, you know, a billion years and maybe at that point we'll pay some attention. But there are other explanations too. I mean, maybe uh, life is rare, right? I mean, we always have this idea in mind, I think, that at this point life is commonplace. Well, we don't know that. Or maybe life is commonplace, but intelligent life is rare. Right? I mean, if that asteroid hadn't smashed into us 65 million years ago, who knows? Maybe it's still dinosaurs walking around and they're not building radio telescopes and sending out spaceships. You know, the other possibilities are, are, are legion. I mean, the universe now, 92 billion light years across, the observable universe in terms of the things that we've had calls of contact with. We have traveled one and a half light seconds 
from Earth. We have sent out probes that have gone out, I don't know, five or six light hours. Right. So to say, why aren't they here? The universe is a big place. And it's not so easy to travel over large distances if you're constrained by the barrier of the speed of light. So what, what's, the, what's our furthest impact on the universe? Just bad television from 70 years ago? Is that? Uh, yeah, so, so if you take, well, seven, so, no, I mean, I guess TV, you know, radio signals. Go, right. go back to, say, to 1900 something. So maybe, you know, generously, 150 light years, if you allow, you know, any transmission that we sent out there. That's so 150 awesome. light years compared to, you know, 92 billion light years, yep. right? That's not much. Although I, I, the intuition is that if, because if you, you look at the, the fact that we have gone from you know, barely walking upright to sending out our own space probes in a very short period of time, so you know, 300 years of, of practical science, really. Yeah. And if you think of any, so, so I guess the one assumption you need is that there's nothing really special about Earth. And more and more, it seems that the sense, I mean, even 10 years ago, Earth seemed more special than it does now. Now we're finding planets every day that are seemingly in, in a, some kind of Goldilocks zone with respect to their star. And so if you don't think the conditions on Earth are so special, that they're really a dime a dozen out there in the galaxy and in other galaxies, and then you think the, just we're talking about a time window of, you know, any, any place where life gets going and, and it gets complex is very likely on, it could, could be millions of years on either side of us. Anything, anything that's complex that could build a civilization, you know, is, is not going to, that is very unlikely to have happened in the last 300 years. They, yeah. they, they might as well have, you know, 300 years plus 10 million years to have gotten that going, right? So then you, you would expect just the galaxy to be awash in something that we could detect, right, that has been going on for millions of years. Um, I guess the one, the, the one additional wrinkle that, that we haven't mentioned is that there could just be something about building a complex civilization, building technology that is lethal yep. to species like ourselves. A absolutely. It could be that they're... We're you know, showing every a, sign of it being, being dangerous. Uh, yeah, right, point, right, yeah. right, exactly. I mean, it could be that once you get to the point where you're able to undertake these kind of grand space journeys, you're in a very dangerous situation, and typically you don't survive. Um, there, are, there are more optimistic ways of, of explaining it, though, too. So maybe the universe is teeming with all this activity, it's just not in the wavelengths that we're looking. We're just not right. sensitive to it, right? Maybe the time scales over which the vibrations of whatever medium that they're using are, are incredibly long or incredibly short. So we just hear it as like noise in the background and don't recognize that there's a signal or we don't even have any sensitivity to it at all. Right. So, so their, I think- Their bad television is coming at a different frequency? It could well be. Right, you know, um, so, so I, don't, I don't consider it a paradox. I think it's an interesting point of departure in trying to understand whether we're special, whether life is special, whether intelligence is special. But I mean, from your perspective, right, um, uh, let's say life is commonplace. The journey from life to intelligence is non-trivial. Do you think yeah. that is uh, as straightforward as you might assume in order to come to the conclusion that there should be all sorts of intelligence out there. Well, looking at Earth, you wouldn't draw that conclusion. I mean, Why? Even, even Why do you say that? How well, many species are there on this planet? Well, no, I'm saying, I'm, I, so I, I think I'm agreeing with you. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. that it's, it, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, the truth is I'm even, it's non-trivial even if you look at our own species. Yes, that, that, that's the point, you know? good, yeah. 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 